So in today's segment, we're going to talk about a uh, long range of tasks that form uh, the core of research and development in natural language processing. The simplest uh, or probably the most fundamental uh, task is called part of speech tag. Before we can understand the sentence, we need to understand uh, what part of speech each individual word has. Let's look at this example. The swimmer is getting ready to run in the final race. Some of those words have very obvious parts of speech. So, for example, the is clearly an article, is is clearly a verb, getting is uh, clearly a verb as well, ready is an adjective, and so on. However, some of the words are ambiguous. Let's look at two of them. The first one is the word run. So, in this context, it should be pretty obvious that run is not a noun, it is a verb because it's preceded by uh, the particle to. In other cases, the word run could be preceded by a uh, determiner such as the, and then it will be considered a noun. What about the word final? Is it a noun or an adjective? Well, it's not so obvious in this case because the final could have been a noun, but the final race looks like uh, final is an adjective. And finally, the word race, is it a verb or a noun? Well, it could be the one in general, but in this example, because of the structure of the sentence, it follows uh, an article followed by an adjective, it's much more likely to be a noun. So part of speech tagging is about using rules like these and some statistics to understand the parts of speech of the individual words in a sentence. So if we had his before run, we would label run as a noun, and if we have to before a run, we would label it as a verb. The next task in natural language processing is parsing. So parsing takes a sentence as input and it produces a, a syntactic representation for it. So let's look at some simple sentences in English and uh, later we're going to discuss context-free grammars and parsing in more detail. Here I just want to give an intuition about parsing. So in all of the sentences here we have a subject which is Miriam and we have a verb. Most sentences have a subject and a verb. The verbs, however, here are very different. The first verb here is slept, which, as we know, is an intransitive verb because it doesn't take a direct object. Miriam wrote the novel is uh, an instance of a transitive verb because wrote does take a direct object. Miriam gave Sally flowers is an example of a ditransitive verb because give takes, in this case, two nouns as arguments. So give something to somebody or, in this example, give somebody, something. So we can have two nouns without the preposition to in this form. And then uh, the examples that I showed you earlier, uh, Miriam ate pizza. We have different sorts of prepositional phrases with all is with Sally, which can be attached to either the nearest noun pizza, like in the case of all is, or it can be attached to the verb ate, such as with Sally or with remorse. So parsing usually deals with either a uh, constituent structure, often a phrase structure grammar, like the one that I'm going to describe now, or with what is known as a dependency grammar, which is uh, something we are going to look at in a few minutes. So phrase structure grammar looks like this. It has two parts. In the first part, the one on the left-hand side, we have rules between non-terminals, and on the right-hand side, we have what is known as the lexicon, or rules about terminals or words. So let's see how to interpret the rules on the left-hand side. If we want to generate a sentence, or if we want to parse a string into a sentence, we would have to look for a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. Similarly, a noun phrase can be one of two things. It can be a determiner followed by a noun, or it can be a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase. So examples of determiner noun would be something like this cat, and the second one, NP goes to NPPP, we would have something like this, uh, eat pizza with olives. So pizza with olives would be a noun phrase and with olives is the prepositional phrase. The verb can be either a VBD, which is a past tense verb. It can be a past tense verb followed by a noun phrase. That's the case for transitive verbs. It can be a past tense verb followed by uh, two noun phrases. And it can also have a prepositional phrase, such, in the, such as the case of uh, Sally ate pizza with pleasure. So in that case, with pleasure modifies the verb. P 
PP stands for prepositional phrase, and the first tag in the prepositional phrase is the preposition itself. It's labeled PRP here. In some cases, it's just PR. Now let's look at the lexicon. We have in this particular grammar a uh, determiner that can be either the, that, or a, a noun that can be the child, window, or car, a past tense verb, which is either found, or ate, or so, and finally we have three prepositions in, of, and through. So if you want to produce a parse tree for a sentence, we can build an entire representation like this. The child sold the car through the window. What do we have here? We have a sentence that consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. The noun phrase is the child. The verb phrase is everything else in the sentence. The noun phrase then consists of a determiner and a noun, and then in turn those get translated as the words the and child. The verb phrase, turns into a VBD followed by a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase, and so on. You can continue uh, this uh, inference process a little bit further and fill in all the gaps and complete the sentence. So one example of an external tool that you can use for parsing is the well-known Stanford parser. There are many others out there, but the Stanford parser comes with a very nice demo. You can go to the URL here and type in a sentence, and you will get as output a parse tree as well as a part of speech tagged sequence of all the words in the sentence, as you can see in this example. So the output of the parser looks like this. For example, the sentence on the left is housing starts, comma, the number of new homes being built, comma, then continues on the right, rose 7.2% in March to an annual rate of 549,000 units, comma, up from a revised 512,000 in February, comma, the Commerce Department said. You see that this sentence is fairly complicated, and yet the parser has no problem figuring out its internal structure. Let's look at some of the special things that happen here. For example, commas and other punctuation are labeled as separate uh, syntactic units and separate parts of speech. We have things like adverbial phrases, like up from a revised 512,000 in February. We have uh, embedded clauses. We have uh, very deep recursion and many other interesting phenomena. So when we get to the section on parsing, we will see how parsers work and how they can build uh, the most likely parse given the initial sentence. So now let's switch to an interesting problem in parsing, uh, mostly for fun. It's a NACLO problem uh, known as uh, this problem is pretty and then two uh, slashes, easy. So what does this notation mean? It means that if you say the part of the sentence before the two slashes, the sentence makes sense. But then when you add the last part, you get a completely different sentence that is not a modification of the shorter sentence. It actually means something completely different. So let's try this here. If I say this problem is pretty, I'm essentially saying that I like this problem, it's beautiful. But then if I add an extra word after that, uh, that changes the meaning of the sentence completely. In this case, pretty modifies easy, and what I'm really saying is that the problem is easy, uh, more so it's very easy. So uh, this kind of phenomenon in parsing is known as a garden path sentence, and it has the following properties. There has to be a point in the sentence where you can stop and interpret the sentence in one way syntactically, but if you continue all the way to the end of the sentence, you will get a very different parse tree. So this example actually was motivated by a commercial for a phone company from a few years ago. So the idea was something like this. They want to tell you that the phones that they sell and the, provide, the service that they provide is pretty reliable, and you're not going to be cut in the middle of a sentence when you're making a phone call. So if, you, if this were to happen with one of their competitors' phones, what would happen is that uh, the person listening to the call would only hear the beginning of the sentence and get a very different Im uh, impression of what you were trying to say than if they had heard the entire sentence. So here's some examples of garden path sentences. Don't bother coming versus don't bother coming early. So if you get interrupted after don't bother coming, you will just not go to that place. But if you had heard the full sentence, you would hear, don't bother coming early, which means you should still come, just come on time. Uh, here's some other funny examples. Take the turkey out of the oven at five. So this is an order, like uh, instructions that you give to somebody who's at your home. 
So if they hear only this part, they're going to take the turkey out at five. But what you really meant was take the turkey out of the oven at five to four, which is a very different uh, thing. So if they wait until five o'clock, chances are that it will be overcooked. Here's another one. I got canned. This is something that you don't want to hear over the phone. But maybe the full sentence was, I got canned peaches for dinner. So clearly, the two sentences have very different syntactic structures and very different semantic interpretations. A few more examples. All Americans need to buy a house. OK, maybe yes, maybe no. But that's not what was really intended. What was intended is, all Americans need to buy a house is a lot of money. So you can build the parse trees for those two sentences and realize that they're very different. And can you think of any other such examples? So this was essentially the topic of this NACLO problem that I have in the subject line of this slide. So the solutions are available on the web, on the NACLO site, and there's a lot of examples there. Uh, however, I want to emphasize the criteria that we use to judge them, uh, and the criteria are the following. Uh, the part before the two slashes should be a complete sentence. The full sentence has a different meaning than the part before the slashes. And the part before the slashes should not already be ambiguous. So if those criteria are met, then uh, you get a good solution to this problem. So the other kind of parsing that is very common these days is called dependency parsing. So in dependency parsing, we're not so much interested in S and noun phrases and verb phrases. We're interested in uh, the relationships between words in the sentence without any explicit constituent structure. So a very simple example is shown here. This sentence is, Mary likes yellow apples. So the dependency representation is shown here. It's always in the form of a tree, and it is rooted at the predicate of the sentence. So the most important word in the sentence is considered to be the main verb, in this case, likes. That's why we have it on the top of the slide. Now, in the sentence, Mary likes yellow apples. We have two words that are arguments of the verb likes. For there to be a liking event, there has to be somebody who does the liking and somebody who, quote unquote, receives the liking or is the recipient of the liking. So those two slots in the sentence are filled by Mary and apples. Mary is the liker and apples is the, quote unquote, liked. This is the terminology that is used in linguistics. And finally, we still have one more word left to represent, that is yellow. Yellow does not modify likes, does not modify Mary. The only thing that it modifies is apples. Therefore, we draw it as part of the dependency tree as a child node of apples. So in dependency parsing, we start with a sentence and we produce a dependency structure as the output. And this is something that can come in very handy. For, here's an example from a paper on biological uh, natural language processing. In this case, a sentence was converted into a dependency tree, and then some rules were used on the dependency tree to determine whether there was an interaction between any two particular proteins in that sentence. And again, uh, the dependency structure was what made it possible to understand how those proteins are related. So let's look now at the sample output of a dependency parser. As you can see, every line here connects two words. The words are numbered uh, from 1 to, I guess, 36, which is the last word in the sentence. If you look at the pairs of numbers in each dependency, you will see that you can reconstruct the entire uh, dependency structure of the sentence. You just need to look for a number that only appears once. That would be the root of the sentence. And then all of the uh, children nodes of that node uh, would be the second tier uh, nodes, and then recursively you can build the entire dependency tree. And I will let you figure out this entire tree as a homework. So this concludes the first part of the section on NLP tasks that included morphology, part of speech tagging, and uh, parsing. We're going to continue later with some additional NLP tasks.